All right, it is 1 p.m. so we're gonna get started. Just to let everyone know, this uh, webinar is being recorded. So just be aware that everything that is going to take place today is gonna to be part of a recording that will uh, likely go onto a YouTube video and will be shared with the public. Um, so first off, welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us today for our webinar. Today we are going to talk about our collective lung health and collective lung resources and challenges. So as all of us are likely aware, we're in the middle of a pandemic where respiratory health has been at the forefront of our um, minds. And as we continue to socially distance ourselves, we're also going to find ourselves in the midst of wildfire season. And one of the main risks and challenges that we face every year with wildfire season is wildfire smoke. So today's topic, we really wanted to focus on what some of those resources are for us. Um, as we move into wildfire season, how can we continue to socially distance ourselves, but also prepare for what we need to, to look at, what we need to consider moving into wildfire season, especially for those members of our communities and, um, and our loved ones who are part of those more vulnerable populations. So um, before we get started, I'm just gonna run through a few different housekeeping items. So for those of you who are new to Zoom, um, I just wanna go over a few of the different buttons. Uh, we had already gone over that today's uh, presentation is going to be recorded. So just an FYI for everyone that it is gonna be recorded. Right now, all of you should have had your audio connections muted. If it isn't muted, please make sure that it, it has been turned to mute. So if you, if everyone goes to the bottom of their screen and hovers, they should see a bar with the different icons, um, with different options. Your microphone at the far left corner of your screen should have a mute, um, should, have a, should have a red line through, through the microphone if you are muted. Um, if you are just listening through the phone right now and you are on a traditional telephone, not a uh, cell phone, hit star six and that will cause it to mute. Otherwise, your phone, your uh, cell phone should have a mute button on it. Um, your, please turn your video off as well. We just want to have the different speakers on um, video for today's presentation. We found that when other videos are going, it can hurt with uh, video quality for the actual speakers, but it can also cause a distraction. We really want to make sure that we focused on the content of today. So that's just where the button is in case you guys didn't find it yet. Hopefully everyone has found their mute and video buttons. Finally, at the end of today, we're going to uh, have some time for questions because it's hard to coordinate questions with people uh, verbally asking them. We're gonna ask that everyone ask these questions through the chat box. And this is also gonna be an option at the bottom of that scroll screen. So if you go over to about the middle of that toolbar at the bottom, you should see a chat icon. Make sure that when you're typing in your question that the question is addressed to everyone. Sometimes it is addressed, it might be defaulted to addressing to just one person in the group. So make sure it's addressed to everyone. Uh, just one word to the wise is that the chats are all recorded as well. So please don't write anything even to someone uh, privately that you wouldn't want everyone else to read because it will be published with the rest of the recording. So just, just something to be aware of. All right, so that's it for general housekeeping. Now I'm gonna introduce our panelists. So we have four wonderful panelists with us today. Um, first panelist is Chris Ray. He's the air quality manager for the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation. We also have Caitlin Kelly, who's an air quality policy specialist with the Washington Department of Health. We also have Carolyn Kelly, no relation. Uh, who is the Smoke Management Program Coordinator with Washington Department of Natural Resources. And we also have Gabe Baez, who is our Safety Officer with the Washington Department of Natural Resources. I also wanted to introduce Inez Vargas, who is doing a Spanish translation interpretation for today's webinar. 
that will be recorded and available at a later date um, in the near term future. So just an option, especially if you have colleagues who are monolingual Spanish, this would be a great opportunity for them to get some of the content of today's um, webinar as well. And then finally, I'll be moderating today's conversation. My name is Ashley Blazina. I am the state's community wildfire preparedness coordinator with the Washington Department of Natural Resources. So uh, we're offering a few different webinars and just resources throughout the month. This is Wildfire Awareness Month and we had Wildfire uh, Preparedness Day last Saturday. So um, with social distancing, we've had to change how, how we're approaching this, but smoke is always an area of need for preparedness. So I'm glad that we're able to bring this to all of you and share um, some expertise throughout the state. So without further ado, um, let's get started with our, our uh, conversation today. So the first question I wanted to ask our panelists was, what are some of the different warning signs of bad air quality that folks in Washington and just throughout the country, because I know we have some um, guests on, on the webinar who are from other states, but what are some of those warning signs and what are some of the resources that people can use to um, really be aware of what some of those warning signs are and how to be more prepared for smoke uh, early on? I think I'll start with the, the easiest one. When we usually think of air quality, we think of the air quality index. And the air quality index is a way, it's a set of hazard categories to rate how bad the air quality is. And it's based on several air pollutants in a wildfire smoke we think of, specifically fine particulate matter 2.5. And there's a set of different colors that represent the different levels of risk. So green is good, red is unhealthy for everyone. And we can use this air quality index for the current air conditions and use it to be forecasted in the future so people can think about what are the warning um, potential of bad air quality going in the future. Great. This is Chris. Um, sorry you can't see me, but my camera is malfunctioning. But um, one of the best sources of wildfire smoke information during the summer is the Washington State Smoke Blog and it's uh, updated on a regular basis during wildfire season and smoke season. And that um, blog will present you with a similar map to what you saw in the monitors on it with the different colored dots for each monitor. There's also health related information on there, lots of contact information where the current fires are and ways to look at uh, where the smoke plume is going and coming back from. Also, the Air Resource Advisors, which Carolyn Kelly is one, will post on there when they're on a fire locally and uh, give updates and out, uh, outlooks on where, where and when we can expect smoke. So that, that's the best source of information, and it's updated by uh, a lot of different agencies in the state, Forest Service, Ecology, um, Tribes, and DNR, and so it's, it's a big partnership of, of great people working on it. Excellent. So if people are exposed to smoke, are there any different warning signs that they should really be aware of that they had, um, they may have some adverse health effects? What are some of the warning signs for that in terms of um, just inhaling some of that bad air? So I would say, um, you know, depending on how sensitive folks are, they're going to have a different reaction to it. Um, but that's the thing about smoke is you can sense it. Um, again, like you're showing up here, itchy eyes, runny nose, um, and it could be, it could get pretty severe. So feeling like you have chest problems or um, something related to underlying health concerns um, that people could be sensing. Great. Thank you, guys. Summer, the summer before last, when we were in Kettle Falls for a fire, the boys fire, uh, there was uh, there was very stagnant air that was just sitting in camp and around town, and uh, uh, after a few weeks, you can tell that the coughing in people it just gets uh, like it's coming in from deeper in the chest, and the cat mm. crept when running around, and a lot of people caught it, and so um, along with just the smoke that they're inhaling, 
um, when you have underlying conditions like COPD or congestive heart failure or things like that, it just makes it so much worse. Asthma. So um, it's about protecting protecting yourself and staying inside when you can when you do have any of these symptoms that you're showing on the screen right now. Um, and, and pay attention when, it's, when that cough gets worse because that just means that something else is starting to go on. Great. Well, thank you all. Um, going off of what Gabe just said, what are some of the things that people can do just with staying inside to really help reduce that risk? How can they make some of their spaces inside more, more healthy, give them some clean air spaces? What are some of the different options that people have to make those spaces within their home? Um, sometimes we have those spaces in public spaces, but um, with the pandemic and quarantine, some of those public spaces might not be open and available. So what are some of the options that folks have in, in their homes? So we used to recommend that people go to places like the mall or the library, um, places that are used to having a lot of people and have a, you would expect have a better um, functioning HVAC system, but uh, they're learning that that's really not always the case for every building. So as far as making cleaner air spaces in your home, and I like to say cleaner instead of clean so that people don't get um, overconfident and end up getting overexposed. Um, right. There is some guidance in the wildfire smoke a guide for public health officials, um, which you can find on the internet, um, or I can also send you the resource if you want to share that with others, um, that talks about uh, creating cleaner spaces in your home. The CDC actually just released some interim guidance for clean air shelters and clean air spaces, the community spaces during COVID-19, and is providing some recommendations for how to physically distance, how to screen people coming into these shared spaces, um, cleaning techniques, and how do we communicate that, which is really great that the CDC has just started working on this, especially in the light of where we are right now, preparing for the season. And the great. best investment you can make for your lung health during wildfire season is uh, evaluating your home uh, AC system and seeing if it will take a MERV-13 uh, filter in there that does um, filter out all, all smoke in your house or something lower just filters out less of the wildfire smoke. Or if you uh, want, you should buy a uh, in-room home air filter. These run from uh, $100 all the way up to $700 depending on the capacity on uh, square foot it covers and the, uh, they work really good and they're the best solution to cleaning your rooms or part of your house from smoke intrusion during wildfire season. And uh, that's the best investment you can make. You can also do the do-it-yourself box fan filter um, to also help clean the smoke out of your house. And that, that works really well. It's a little bit cheaper. Still got to invest in filters and there. You don't leave those running all the time or when you're sleeping or when you leave your house, you got to turn those off just for safety concerns. Whereas the manufactured filters, they can run 24 seven. You just got to watch the um, filter cleanliness. And most of those will actually tell you when the airflow is being constricted that the filter needs to change it. Like sh the dirty air filter shown there um, in this, this house where the HVAC system sucks air back through there. Yeah, and after we clean the air, we want to make sure we're not leading to indoor air pollution. So taking steps to reduce um, generating ind more pollution indoors, such as making sure we don't like candles or vacuum or make sure the vacuum has a HEPA filter on it. You know, not smoking inside, um, smoking cigarettes and taking steps to keep that air clean once it is clean. Great. One thing from, uh, one thing from personal experience uh, in regards to these filters, uh, one thing I, would, I wanted to add on top of Chris is just to change them more often than you usually would. And one thing I learned, and it happened to me last year, is that um, when these filters get really clogged up uh, and uh, they can't suck the air anymore, and uh, it's just kind of sucking into the, into the vent system, um, it actually churned off, uh, extinguished my furnace. And that's when I uh, found out when I wasn't getting any more heat and I was checking all the filters and I changed the filter and I was able to spark my furnace back up. So if your furnace ever turns off, um, it's probably because the filter got really clogged up and it needs to be changed. 
It's also a really Are there good any idea other to, warning signs? Oh, sorry, go oh, ahead, sorry. Carolyn. No, just, just saying that uh, it's a really good idea to plan ahead so that there's not a huge rush for filters, kind of like we saw with toilet paper and COVID, um, to be prepared for those ahead of time. So what should people be doing now to, to help prepare, prepare these spaces? And should they be preparing one room in their house or should it be the entire house? What are some recommendations you guys have have for creating these clean air spaces inside inside homes? Well, people should definitely be thinking about preparing their homes and, and places of work for wildfire smoke because when it hits, it will get into your house. There's no way to keep it out hardly. Uh, been looking into different scenarios for that. And the biggest thing, like I mentioned before, is check out your air conditioning system or buy the air filters. But you also want to look at uh, gaps in your um, around your doors and windows or whatever. Um, check and see if you have a in window air conditioner. Make sure that it, you can have a recirculation setting on there that won't bring in outside air into your house. Otherwise, you have to turn it off and, uh, because it just will inundate your your home. So preparing now is is the key to that. And um, Yeah, and then you also want to look at your car air filters because that's really important and sometimes missed by your uh, maintenance people. And uh, it takes about 20 minutes to clean out the air in your car using a, um, if your car is equipped with a HEPA filter to take out the smoke from inside your car. So if you're commuting, you're still getting uh, exposed to smoke until that HEPA filter does its job in your car. Thanks. There is also the EPA has a really great toolkit. Um, I think it's just called the Wildfire Smoke Toolkit on their site that uh, folks can use to get ideas and start planning ahead. And that EPA has in that toolkit has really great guidance on indoor air quality because as we're thinking about how we overlap with COVID and we want, you know, if we're still encouraging people to stay inside, we want to make sure our homes are have good um, clean indoor air. And keeping a good diligent schedule during wildfire season is a great idea too. You know, share the share the work with the family and do certain things a little more often during wildfire season and make sure that we uh, address those gaps like around the windows and drafts that are coming in and out and under the doors and things like that, like Chris was saying. Great. Thank you all. Yeah. Uh, Chris, I, I like your point about uh, the cars and then doing the air filters in the car. I know that for um, the Paradise Fire, a lot of people just forgot to turn their air on to research as they were evacuating. And that caused some of their cars to be just filled with smoke. And so another thing to consider is just how are we really, are we preparing and putting that as part of our um, plans is really thinking about when we're actually evacuating, what are those procedures going to look like and how are we going to um, protect ourselves from smoke during evacuation too. That's another part of preparedness that is sometimes overlooked and um, until I heard kind of those lessons learned from Paradise, I hadn't considered that either. So um, thank you for bringing that up. So I wanted to turn a little bit to masks because that's been a big topic of conversation lately is just um, what are the right masks? What are the appropriate masks for for um, for the pandemic, but also for wildfire? Uh, people, it seems like there is some different opinions about what, what that could be, or just in terms of the public, what the public opinion is. So I'd love to hear your guys' expert opinions on what masks are really appropriate for, um, for wildfire smoke, um, and, and if this should be the first line of defense for folks or if they should be considering other options before? Yeah, there's a lot of challenges when we think about a 95 respirator used for wildfire smoke. Um, originally, these masks are designed for an occupational setting, so translating their use and their proper use over to the general public has definitely been a challenge. And, um, but I just first wanna highlight that PP N95s are considered a form of PPE. And so when we're thinking about reducing exposure to a contaminant, they're at the bottom of the hierarchy of controls. So we want to be taking other steps, like setting up a clean air room, reducing physical outdoor activity during smoke events before we, we turn to N95 respirators and they're used um, you know, when you need to go outside and go to the grocery store. 
but um, there's a lot of challenges to getting the general public to use them properly. You know, N95 respirators, when we're in an occupational setting, um, they go through people wearing them, have to be medically cleared to make sure they're wearing, um, can, you know, be wearing one. They have to be properly trained and go through a process of fit testing. The fit testing makes sure to ensure that individual is that mask is fitting on their face um, and providing protection. And that is not really accessible to the general public. And the training really is inconsistent oftentimes. And the information and properly communicating risk and the nuances behind these masks um, can be challenging. And we've seen um, right now with N95 respirators, we're encouraging to save for COVID-19 to save these for healthcare workers. And we want to con continue leaving and saving N95 respirators through the wildfire smoke season for um, that group of people until we learn more that we have um, more available. Yeah, one quick comment is um, the reason why we're using masks now is to sort of keep your germs to yourself. Whereas when we're talking about using N95 masks for wildfire smoke, it's to prevent inhaling the particles. So that there might be some confusion there as well for, well, if this works for that, maybe it will work for this, but it's different. Mm -hmm. And with N95 respirators, what, when you put on that mask, you get a seal and that 95% um, is how much the HEPA filter in the mask can filter the particles. But with fabric masks, um, we don't get that seal and don't have that filter to create that negative pressure for the particles to um, go through. So currently before COVID-19, we were not recommending fabric masks um, for use during wildfire smoke because as Carolyn pointed out, it's about preventing you sharing your germs, not the other way around. Thank you. Pre previous picture you had up there showing the, the N95 mask that it can be used to demonstrate what, what you're really looking for in a mask. You have the two straps, one to go above your ear, one to go below your ear, so it holds it tight to your face. You have the nose pinch piece on there, and it's usually sometimes the better masks are padded underneath too, so you can get a tighter uh, form fit around your nose. And then there's the um, valve on the front of the mask that lets you breathe out your, your breath out easier so you're taking half the work away. You're not having to breathe through that mask, but it closes up when you're breathing in. So all the air is filtered through the material. And then when you breathe out, it goes through, through the valve. So those are the best type of mask. And you can actually wear them a little longer without feeling claustrophobic. And uh, they don't um, gather the, the moisture inside as, as much as the other type of masks do too. One of the other challenges with N95 respirators is there's a lot of different make and models. And those 3M, Moldex are available, you know, other brands on Amazon, but not every mask and model fits to an individual's face. The face shape is really important in choosing fit. And you can't really know if that mask is fitting properly without going through the fit testing process. So going other, off of that, oh, go ahead, Gabe. One other. One other concern is obviously when you're restricted like that with an N95 mask in a wildfire setting, uh, you know, the subject of heat related illness comes up. And so that just, that doesn't help. <laughs> so when people are already having trouble breathing, they're hot, uh, and they're carrying equipment. And so uh, that's just another consideration. I noticed a question on the chat about, you know, for saving N95, what should we wear during wildfire season? And I, I want to hit home the point that, um, you know, we should be taking other steps to increase, you know, improve indoor air and um, other interventions and consider masks as a, as a last step um, to reduce exposure when you need to. So, yeah, I guess, Caitlin, just going off of that, this kind of goes off of that hierarchy of controls, right? Just going off of what are the different things people can do, and the PPE is really the at the bottom. It should be their last step, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the hierarchy okay. controls, we typically think in a workplace setting, but, you know, creating clean indoor air and changing your behavior goes into engineering controls, administrative controls that can be applied. And when we think about N95 respirators, it's originally an occupational use, so we're still learning a lot about how to translate um, their use from occupational setting to a general public setting. Okay, well, I think this is a good time, um, even though 
not everyone should be using an annuity five just to see how to properly use one. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to let Gabe and Caitlin take over. Gabe has a mask ready to go, so I'm going to pin his video and Caitlin's going to walk us through how to uh, accurately put on a mask and then also how to take one off, especially if you do are do have COVID-19. Yeah, great. So Gabe has two types of N95 masks. One of them on the left does have a little bit padding on the inside. Um, and masks are all have different shapes, um, sizes, and um, yeah, you know, it's about finding something that works best with your face. But to learn how to properly wear one on, um, we do have a lot of materials available to the general public, fact sheets, training videos, whatnot. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and walk through the steps. And so to start, we're going to have um, you're hold the respirator cupped in your hand with the, the front facing down with making sure that metal nose piece is at the top of your fingertips. And then making sure those straps are hanging freely below your hand. Um, so then you can um, hold them above your face. So now we're going to place the respirator on um, your face with the bottom um, by your chin and the metal nose piece at the top, making sure it's secure. And then you're going to take that top strap over around um, your head and place it above your ears. You want to make sure that it's not crooked um, or twisted or anything like that. And then now you're going to take the bottom strap up and over your hand and behind your head to below your ears. And again, making sure it's not twisted um, or crossed with the top one as such. And then now we're going to mold that nose piece. You want to make sure you're using both your hands to do so, starting here, and be molding down um, and up towards your cheekbones. Uh, we want to be concerned about not pinching because um, there's concerns if you just pinching, you might not actually get that seal right there. And then um, now we're going to check to make sure that the respirator is a fit. So sometimes this is called a seal check. And you're going to place both your hands over um, the respirator covering all of it, and you're going to exhale. And if you can feel air leaking from the sides around your nose, you can go back and keep sealing that nose piece down. And if you're feeling air coming around the sides, you can adjust the strap higher. And if you make adjustments because you were um, finding that air was leaking, you want to make sure to perform that field check again and keep going through that process. But it's really important to not be moving around the respirator because we're going to lose that seal if you keep moving. And that's something that I know I've seen in the grocery store when I was doing right now in COVID is people wearing masks. They, they're moving them around, which is um, one of the concerns. And so now to make sure we're going to take this off properly, which, you know, when we're thinking about infectious disease and not keep touching our hands and recontaminate ourselves, this is an important process. And so um, to take it off, um, we're going to start with pulling the bottom strap up and over um, your head first so that we're not losing it. It's going to fall off your face without touching the, the mask. And then now you'll take the top strap and bring it up and over your head without touching the filter material, and then you'll dispose of it properly. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. That was really helpful. Great. I'm going to unpin Gabe's picture. Thank you, Caitlin, for walking us through that. And Gabe, thank you for, for sharing. Thank you for being the model for it. Um, so what I just want to touch briefly on some of the the different cloth mask options that people have been wearing and just wanted to get some feedback from you guys in terms of what what uh what level of protection those really offer and if that if they should be worn at all what what are some of the things that you guys see in terms of concerns about oops I'm going to the wrong side sorry about that what are some of the concerns you guys see with how people are wearing them? Um, I found this graphic that just looks at some of the wrong ways to wear masks, um, but what are some of the other challenges that uh, the cloth masks really pose and, um, and can be uh, challenging right now and then also in uh, wildfire season? I think we started talking about this a little bit earlier, but um, previously we were not recommending fabric masks for wildfire smoke um, because you're not, you don't have the filter material, um, the, 90, the HEPA filter in Canada that seal. 
Um, but I know we've all seen a lot of increased research and in news articles coming out about um, new information about different materials that can filter efficiency, like um, blue tea towels. And it's important to keep looking up on that, but you know, if it's not just about the, the material that can filter the particles, it's about achieving that fit and that seal, and then how do we communicate that? And um, I think that's gonna be the challenge moving forward is now a lot of people have access and are comfortable and have, are you know way more used to wearing fabric masks. Like I do think we'll see an increased use in them for wildfire smoke, even if it's not uh, quite what we want um, people to be doing. Is there is there an average amount that those are actually helping? I know we looked a little bit at, and I'll bring back the graphic on just the particulates, but um, how often is it actually helping with some of those particulates in wildfire smoke? Um, is it is it blocking out any some of those cloth masks, or is it something that we really we really do need to be treating it as a last step and be doing a lot of the other things previous to this to really help ourselves and help prepare um, our families and loved ones? Well, most firefighters, <clears throat> most wildland firefighters that are out there already usually carry either a bandana, a band, well, they have the shrouds inside the helmets, mm -hmm. but they also carry bandanas that they wear a lot of the time. Uh, but, you know, it's not something that's tested and, and to tell you exactly how many particles it's actually not letting into the mask. And so, um, like Caitlin was saying, it's the bottom of the hierarchy. So. And there's, um, you know, it comes down to, yeah, if we, if we have fabric masks, it might be helping a little bit, you know, if it's better than nothing, but how do we balance that with the false sense of security that people may have? And they might overuse it when they, you know, think that it is providing protection. And then that is really hard to communicate to the public, that balance. That makes sense. And they just need to be cleaned more often, you know, even though you don't see physical particles in the mass, it's probably full of it. So the public should just know that they need to clean it more often than usual, even if it doesn't <laughs> look dirty. Just like the filters, yeah, that makes sense. Um, so what are some different ways that you guys would recommend supporting some members of our communities, of our families who are part of those more vulnerable populations, both during COVID-19, but also often to wildfire smoke. So folks who already have pre-existing respiratory issues, um, some of the elderly, uh, what, some pregnant women, what, what kind of things would you recommend doing? Um, it can be anything from just providing educational resources um, to creating clean air spaces, but what are some things you guys would recommend? I think one of one of the main things you can do, especially um, you know with the elderly, um, is just check in on them, give them a call, see how they're doing. Uh, if they need anything, maybe you can make a run to the grocery store so they don't have to go outside. Um, and then you can just leave them on the front step. You don't even have to see them. But uh, just checking on folks and helping them out, because now I think you know more than anything, we need to be there to support each other and and work together as communities. And encouraging the communities to just have a plan have a backup plan, have a place to go already set up in case you do need to leave and you want to go somewhere safe with your kids and your pets. Uh, so just encouraging the community to have a good plan on, on where you're going to go in case you have to evacuate because of bad smoke or wildfire itself. I hate saying keep your kids inside all summer, but it is, you know, in their best interest. Um, and I imagine lots of parents are kind of tired of that right now. But on the plus side, um, since teachers have been having to come up with new innovative ways to teach kids, um, there's a lot more out there for parents to hopefully entertain their kids with or keep the education going or whatever they prefer to do with them. Awesome. Yeah. This is Chris again. Just, just stay informed about what the uh, wildfires in your area are doing or where the smoke is coming from makes a big difference. And uh, a few years ago, we started getting smoke in our area from Siberia. And we had mm. uh, for sensitive groups uh, category for most, most of each day for two weeks from that smoke. And then it became regional smoke and then local smoke. And then we were in the uh, hazardous or unhealthy category and the 
air quality index for two weeks straight for a 24 hour average. So just being informed of where that smoke's coming from and when you expect to get it will help you uh, air out your house. So in the morning when the smoke lays down in the valley, you can keep your house closed up. And in the evening, if the smoke is still rising and not laying in the valley, you can open up your house, turn the fan so it's bringing the fresh air and blowing the smoke out of your house. That always helps too. So you have to be aware of those cycles of smoke and, and keeping track of that on the smoke blog will help. And looking on the um, smoke ready toolbox site for EPA will also give you uh, some good ideas on what to, to look for. I think this is a really Great. important question um, to be thinking about because a lot of the, the populations that are sensitive to wildfire smoke, you know, um, elderly, children, pregnant women, people with pre-existing conditions are at, at, risk, in, at increased risk for COVID-19 as well. So I think it's um, also a good way to be encouraging conversations with their healthcare providers and encouraging, you know, those groups to reach out to healthcare providers and also vice versa and provide messaging to healthcare providers to have those conversations. And I know um, St. Jude's Children's Research or Hospital, I forget what it is, um, they were putting out some information on children and N95 masks. So that's one place to get some information, but definitely that's something that you're gonna to wanna to talk to your doctor about. Great. And I know you guys in the chat box, oh, sorry, Gabe, I'll let you go. Oh, I think one more uh, consideration for the community to remember that if you do have a wildfire, nearby and smoke and uh, and and uh, you have uh, you have children that have underlying conditions to make sure that they have plenty of medicine uh, it's so, uh, in case they ever need it so, and medicine for themselves yes so mo most of the things we've been talking about preparing you can prepare ahead of time when you put your to go kit together for emergencies so you have that well, your supplies lined up, you got your uh, communications plan, you have your travel plan there for evacuation when the smoke gets so bad or the fire's coming over the hill at you, you know where you're going to go. So it takes that decision making out of that process. And when you're under stress and you're breathing lots of smoke and there's ozone in the air and you just don't make decisions very good at that point. So it's good to have all those decisions made ahead of time. So Get, get your guidance going on, uh, look for the guidance on to-go kits. Um, we just put out some new guidance this week on that and certainly on our, our networks for that, including a mask in there, plus um, some other items that are, are needed. So, but mainly it's got your travel plans and your communications uh, plan in there too. Yeah, I think a huge part of planning um, also is knowing where to go for information. So anyone that you would associate with wildfire, the Forest Service, the EPA, um, your local air quality uh, agency or air quality program, um, those will all have information about preparing for wildfires and dealing with wildfire smoke. Um, and so like everybody on this call, we're, we're here to help. We've got tons of resources we'd love to get out to people. So we're always good contacts as well. Awesome. So in terms of, I know you guys have, thank you panelists for sharing some of those. I think Carolyn and Caitlin, you guys have all shared a few different links on the chat box. Um, how would you guys, if people are just getting started with these plans, would it be smoke ready toolkits or what would be, what would be the best place for people to start? Um, if they're just, because I mean, yeah, right now, I mean, stress is a little bit higher. So giving yourself a little bit extra time to really develop these evac plans, these go kits, um, thinking about how you're going to prepare for smoke is huge. So where would you guys recommend people start if they're just getting started? The Washington State Department of Health um, has a smoke from fires page with the commonly asked questions, which is just a good way to get it, um, int introduced to, you know, some of the issues and has links to a lot of the other resources we've talked about today. Yeah, and there are, right. there are a ton of resources, but um, some people might just want to give someone a call and say, hey, what do I need to know about this or where should I go? So there's also resources that are people that can give you help and guide you with those plans. And all, all those links that uh, Caitlin and Carolyn just mentioned and a lot of others are also on the smoke blog, Washington State smoke blog under the health um, tabs. So you can also plenty of links there to keep you, keep you busy and learning about uh, what goes into it. 
There's also the a higher level of planning is uh, smoke ready communities, where a group of people will get together and form a partnership to look at how to deal with smoke in their communities, wildfire smoke, prescribed fire smoke, uh, wood stove smoke, backyard burning smoke, all types of smoke, because it's our yearly exposure that's really going to uh, hurt us in the long run. Although the wildfire smoke is the most chronic and, and pressing matter because it's also the thickest and the, uh, the highest concentrations, but we're, we're exposed most of the year. So if you uh, yeah. think about, you know, your, your community becoming smoke ready and, and what, the, what are the economic impacts of smoke? What, what, how do you um, run a business during smoke? How do you take care of kids during smoke events? Um, so those things are, are a higher level uh, planning group and, and there's several around that, that are good examples for that. We can provide you contacts for those. And another reminder for, for the community as well is to that when you do receive information that you're actually getting information from a reputable source. Um, there's a lot of things that are going out in the internet and uh, a lot of what ifs and I heard this and I heard that. Uh, but, you know, uh, sources like Ecology, CDC, DOH, uh, the Emergency Op Operations Center in Camp Murray, um, they're constantly putting out information. Those are reputable sources, along with the toolkit and things like that, smoke for the toolkit. Uh, so just a reminder for folks that don't believe everything you read on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and with COVID-19, I think we're going to, we're, I've heard from a lot of partners and we're starting to have internal discussions about what is going to be our recommendations for wildfire smoke and COVID-19. So I think as we get closer, we're going to see more and more messaging and information available how to be ready to, for wildfire season um, during this time. Speaking of being smoke ready, uh, Smoke Ready Week is actually coming up next month, the week of June 15th, I believe it is. Um, so air quality communicators are going to be putting out uh, social media messages and information, resources, all that fun stuff for helping folks get ready for smoke. Awesome. Okay, well, we have, it looks like about, um, well, we'll almost go to questions, but I wanted to see if you guys had any final thoughts, any last message you really wanted to share with everyone who is on the webinar today and then anyone who might be watching it later before we go to the chat box and um, start going over some of the questions. I would just say um, plan ahead. Uh, plan ahead and reach out to us if there's anything that you need. If we don't have the answers, we can get you in touch with somebody who does. Um, we want you to be as ready for smoke as, as possible. And during wildfire uh, smoke events in your area, um, do everything possible to minimize your exposure to smoke. That's, that's the main thing during, during the events and implement your planning that Caroline just mentioned from ahead of time. And then you also have to be aware that after smoke events, when you get hazardous air um, quality from wildfire smoke, you're, uh, you might need to clean your house. You might need to wash off the inside and outside of your house because smoke sticks to everything. In 2015, I had to, you know, we had to wash all every cloth surface in the house because it all smelled like smoke because we didn't have air filters or air conditioning. So our windows had to be open at night and because it was 105 out during the day. So we also have that cooling factor in there. So think, think about air conditioning if you can and how to cool your house during smoke events because it's always hot at those times too. Right. I think Thank I just you, want to hit, hit home that, you know, be ready to have um, clean indoor air, especially if we're still with um, struggling with COVID-19 and sheltering in place or encouraging uh, physical distancing um, to have your space ready now, whether that's purchasing a portable clean air filter um, and finding those resources. So uh, somewhat related to that, um, there's been reports that people aren't going to the emergency room when they're having health issues because they're afraid of getting COVID. Um, but it's really important that you do act when you're having issues and when you feel like you need to be going to the hospital, you should go. Especially if you're part of those sensitive subpopulations, whether you're, you already have a pre-existing illness, if you're over 65, have children um, or pregnant, be monitoring your symptoms. Thank you. 
Right. Any, Gabe, do you have any last thoughts before we go to the group chat? Uh, no. Uh, so fire departments across the state, they already have protocols in place on how to protect themselves if they have to come to your house for an emergency. So uh, they are fully protected. They have all their PPE. So don't be afraid to have the fire department. They may take a little bit longer because they do need to don all their gear before they uh, enter the home and make sure that they're prepared, um, especially if it's a confirmed COVID case. So just be a little bit more patient. And my last thing is don't forget to clean around your property, around your home in case of wildfire. Uh, so make that buffer of protection around your home and, uh, and clean, clean it out as much as you can uh, so that your home is protected. That's about all I have. Thanks for that plug, Gabe. Yeah, we have a few other events happening this month and uh, a recording that went over that topic um, in depth uh, just last week. So there's a recording that's available on our YouTube page as well regarding that. That was done with King Conservation District and Kids Has Fire Adapted Communities. So thank you for touching on that. Um, then we'll have some more later this month as well. But yeah, thank you guys. Uh, so I'm going to go to the Zoom group chat. If I'm, I'm going to just go through the questions. Looks like there's been a few uh, different questions throughout the throughout the call, um, the webinar today. So one from Jonah says, "There's a need for fresh air ventilation to flush out the virus." Um, a larger question is, what do we do when we can't do that during wildfire smoke time? So do we know if HEPA and MERV 13 filters will catch the virus. And do any of you guys have information on that? Sounds like Kelly. <laughs> oh, yeah, Caitlin might yeah, be the person to go to there. Uh -huh. I don't know. Um, there is some, I've seen some talk about they could. Um, I don't know that research is really strong yet to be able to. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, we do want to have clean, fresh indoor air, and we're air and that, that those filters are a good way to start doing that. Um, but I think that is definitely an area that we hope to address before wildfire season and take a look and hopefully we find some more um, information on that. Great. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, everything's so new with COVID that it's hard to, the research is having to come really quickly. So it's a huge challenge. Um, Another question from the chat box is, will state and local health agencies have N95 masks available for the public like in the past? And I'm not sure how widely available they were available. I think the emphasis the right now is, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I hadn't heard about that, but yeah. um, as everybody knows, the emphasis right now is to make sure that our health care workers and first responders have all they right. need in order to protect themselves. And so i um, not really sure what the influx of N95 masks coming into the state, um, but for the summer at least, um, probably going to be Oh, looks like Gabe, Gabe's um, video is freezing. Gabe, um, maybe if you turned off your video, it might be able, might be able to hear you. Well, we'll, 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 Gabe, it looks like you're back now. It looked like you, fr you froze for a little bit, but yeah, um, I think we caught most of what your answer was, so that, that works, thank you. Um, so one quick question, another person asked about emphasizing, oh, go ahead, Gabe. <laughs> I'm free. You guys are freezing up momentarily. Yeah, you are as well. So that's all right. No worries. Um, we're going to go to the, the next question. Um, Cleaning. We touched a little bit on cleaning. How often should people be cleaning their masks? Um, you said more em emphasizing more frequent cleaning, but how often is more frequent? What is a good amount of cleaning that people should be doing with their masks? How often?
I think that's just going to be a personal preference on folks and how bad the area is around uh, your community. And uh, so this is a, there's quite a few factors on, you know, that have to do with cleaning whatever mask that you have and doing it properly. It just depends on the mask and what you're using and how bad it is. There's a lot of, there's not a lot of research out, um, out there about face masks and wildfire smoke in general public use and cleaning and, you know, PM 2.5. It's, it's really hard to be putting out that um, recommendations and this, this evidence is still still limited and there's definitely a lot of increase in um, this research coming out though. Thanks. Thanks. Um, just wanted to, to note that Gretchen Stewart from the EPA uh, said that she does have some information on furnace filtration and capturing the virus. It's still, uh, there's still little evidence she says of that um, and she can share the information if desired. So Gretchen, if you could share that with everyone, that would be great. Um, one thing I also wanted to ask is if all the panelists could put their email addresses in the chat box, everyone, so that everyone has your, um, has your contact for going after the webinar. Um, but I'll go to the next question. So um, this is, comes from Kat over in the Metal Valley. Um, many people in the Mental Valley, my husband included, have jobs that require them to be outside. He can limit the time outside somewhat, but he must spend a fair amount of it outdoors. So in the past, uh, her and her husband have both worn N95 masks, um, but will there be other options for people who have outdoor jobs or what are some different options that you guys would recommend for, for that purpose? So if, if you do have an outdoor job during wildfire season, how they can limit some of those effects? of smoke inhalation. I think that's a key group, you know, if we do have limited supplies of N95 masks during wildfire season due to the need for, um, you know, them to be safe for COVID, that would be a group that I know I would encourage. Uh, we still, you know, prioritize them as well. Um, I hope, I think this would be a great question for L and I to address and you no, know, I don't have any information though on what they're currently working on. Yeah, I know there's been an interest in how do we protect people who have to work outside. Um, so there's definitely, like Caitlin just said, some research coming through on that. But again, it kind of goes back to, you know, if there's anything that you can do, like take your breaks outside of the smoke or other actions you can do to try to minimize your um, interaction in the smoke. Thanks. It looks like Gretchen is going to forward the information to Carolyn Kelly. Um, and so, Carolyn, if you could forward that to me, or Gretchen, if you could just send that to me, either way, uh, that will work, and then I can get it out to everyone who um, RSVP'd for the webinar. So that'd be great. Excellent. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, and then we had one more question on K95S use for wildfire smoke. If there's been any guidance, do you guys know of any guides or um, research that's been done on how effective those really are? So if they're not NIOSH certified, then we, we can't really guarantee how effective they are if they have not gone through their um, a process of you know efficiency. And Gay might have more information on that as a, a safety officer. I was frozen and I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Uh, the question was, has there been any guidance on KN95S, K, KN95s for use uh, with wildfire smoke? Has there been any research that's been done about whether they are recommended or not um, that you know of? I do not know what the uh, most recent recommendation for the K95 masks are on Fireline. And I think the reason for that is that we weren't uh, recommending them for the, you know, along with the N95s who were on the fire line only because, you know, they're semi-flammable. And so, uh, but there hasn't been much research done about having to use them on the front line. Gotcha, neat. Thank you all. Um, it looks like we've gone through all of the questions that were in the chat box. Um, 
And so unless we have any other questions, I would just like to thank all of our panelists for their expertise today. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your wisdom. Um, and thank you to everyone who came to today's webinar. I know we had a pretty packed house, so appreciate everyone RSVPing to this event. Um, this event, as I mentioned earlier, is gonna be recorded, and so that recording will be sent out to all the, uh, our, all the folks who RSVP'd and will also be posted online for everyone to see who wasn't able to come today. Um, and then also Inez Vargo is going to be, or Vargas, sorry, my apologies, will also be doing the translation for this into Spanish, which will be recorded and posted later as well. So thank you all so much and have a great afternoon. Stay safe, stay healthy, and um, yeah, have a great rest of your week. Bye everyone.